So now I'd like to introduce our Aquatic Restoration and Resiliency Coordinator, Brittany Rogers, who will be showcasing our Aquatic Restoration Initiative. Thank you so much, Megan, and hello to everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I see a bunch of people are still popping in on the line for the webinar, but also um, I am aware that many of you might be watching this on YouTube after, so thank you so much for watching the recording. And so I just wanted to go over a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. So. Um, I'll reintroduce everybody back to the project area because there are a lot of people from out of state and even out of uh, the country that have joined us. So we'll talk about project area, Lula Prism in general. I know some of you uh, that might be a reminder for, but hopefully that's okay with you all. And then we'll dive into the projects and some of the work that we've been doing, as well as giving time for question and answer and discussion at the end. So. Like I said, thank you so much for joining, especially those of you who are new to SWELO or new to this webinar series. Um, I know some of you I've worked closely with over the years and some I haven't. So make sure if you haven't done it already to introduce yourself in the chat box. I will likely uh, turn my video off just to make sure that we don't have any issues with bandwidth. So just wanted to say hi to everyone and I will shut that off now. Awesome. So I just want to take a moment and start this webinar with just taking a step back from everything and making sure that everybody's kind of on the same page, thinking about the region that we're working in and is more familiarized with the area as we focus our scope in on a really small scale portion of this huge map. So on the screen, you should be familiar or you might be familiar with the Great Lakes Basin. So this is from flowing from west to east, eventually reaching the ocean through the St. Lawrence River. Um, this is the larger watershed that contains many smaller rivers and streams and watersheds within it. So focusing in on the New York region a little bit more closely. New York's waters fall into 17 major watersheds or drainage basins, including lakes, rivers, and streams. And many of those starting from west to east include the Niagara River and Lake Erie, Genesee River, Oswego River, Finger Lakes, the Lake Ontario and Minor Tributaries watersheds, Black River, St. Lawrence River, and Champlain. Um, that's all just kind of falling within that Great Lakes Basin. So of those, we're going to focus in on this Eastern Lake Ontario, St. Lawrence region. And that includes 16 eight-digit Huck watersheds within our boundaries of the Flula Prism. I know not everyone is familiar with that yet, but we'll get to that in a moment. One of the cool things about our region is that we are actually connected to the Mid-Atlantic as well. So in the southern portion of our region, we do have portions of watersheds in the Susquehanna and Shenango regions that actually flow south to the Chesapeake. So just something cool to share about. But I do want to zoom in even closer today into the Eastern Lake Ontario region. You can see in that uh, black box on the screen here. So these are where the, per the projects that I will be talking about today will fall into. And um, just kind of thinking about as we move through this day that we are actually much more connected beyond these boundaries that we've created, say, of the Sliwa region or some of those watersheds in the Great Lakes Basin as well. So I'd just like to briefly introduce the Sliwa Prism or the St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management, if you're not familiar. It's one of eight prisms in New York State and was founded in 2011. It covers five counties, including Jefferson, Lewis, Oneida, Oswego, and St. Lawrence. And our organization is hosted by the Nature Conservancy, whose mission is to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. The vision of the Nature Conservancy is a world where diversity of life thrives, and people ask to conserve nature for its own sake and its ability to fulfill our needs and enrich our lives as well. Here in the Sliva Prism, we work along the waters of Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River, as well as Oneida Lake, Black Lake, Salmon River, and other major rivers like Oswego, Oneida, and Black River, and so many more. So we have quite the large geographic scope that our program works in. And our core programming is focused on invasive species, including the prevention, early detection, rapid response, management and control, ecological restoration, which is why you are all joining today, and as well as education outreach, another reason why we're here today. 
Uh, we have multiple special initiatives that we've been working on, including the Aquatic Restoration Initiative, Black River Trail Feasibility Study that was conducted last year, many years of environmental DNA monitoring, and our Watercraft Inspection Steward Program. Um, there's a couple other special initiatives listed, but those are more terrestrial focused, and I won't be talking about those today. To focus our work in our region, we prioritize our species based on the new tiered species list, which was developed in uh, developed by the New York Natural Heritage Program and IMAP Invasives, and that was in collaboration with invasive species professionals across the state. So each region or each of those eight prisms has their own tiered species list that they really focus on. And so we also took that large list and kind of narrowed it down to these species that have been nominated as priority within our region. If anyone on the line is interested in learning more about that, you can check it out on our website. If you go to soilinvasives.org and backslash tiered species list. In 2021, we successfully kicked off a Pledge to Protect campaign, which is an outreach initiative that aims to protect our lands and waters from invasive species. And this is all, all mostly done through community engagement. So there's five pledge categories for this, and that includes lands, trails, forests, community, and waters, which is something that hopefully you're all interested in, the water component. Um, there are multiple uh, program informations that, it, that are themed towards each of those categories that are being shared, and it's focused on um, people who in, enjoy the environment or hikers, boaters, landowners, community members, gardeners, and so much more. So we encourage people to take this pledge and become a protector of that resource that they're interested in. And with that, they'll get monthly emails to learn more about ways that they can protect these regions or share that information with others. And also there's virtual badges and uh, toolboxes that you'll get access to. And we do multiple competitions that have prizes. So if anyone's interested, please feel free to visit ipledgetoprotect.org and take the pledge and join us in protecting our lands and waters. So thank you again so much for joining and being interested in learning more about our aquatic restoration initiative and how we're working together to restore critical riparian corridors within the Eastern Lake Ontario region. I'm Brittany Rogers and I am your presenter for today. I'm the Aquatic Restoration and Resiliency Coordinator and I focus on all things aquatic invasive species related. A few years back, partners of the Sleeva Prison engaged in a process to identify and prioritize goals and objectives for our 2019 to 2023 strategic plan. And this plan was to maximize the potential conservation benefit through our work within Pluto Prism. So identified as one of the eight major goals of our program was ecological site restoration. And restoration projects are a really important part of our work as it connects our control and management work to the promotion of native flora and fauna while also encouraging more resilient ecosystems to invasive species and our changing climate. This initiative specifically is designed to restore and preserve select aquatic and riparian areas that you'll learn more about in the Eastern Lake Ontario region. So both of the projects that I'm talking about today are part of a larger collaboration between the Nature Conservancy, Sleeva Prism, and multiple partners, stakeholders, and private or public landowners on the line today. So today I'm planning to share a little bit more about our strategy and the work that we are doing. And I'm going to ask all of you to think critically about resources that you may have encountered or recommendations from your experiences that you can share with us that we might be able to work together to improve the efficiency and the value of our work. So just to bring everybody into the same frame of mind before we get really too deep into the project, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the terminology of ecosystem restoration. I know oftentimes it's a term that's kind of used as a blanket coverall, and I just want to kind of bring everybody back and to break it up into smaller pieces as we continue to have this discussion. So eco ecological restoration is actually part of this continuum of restorative activities. So it's only acting as one of many strategies that are being utilized to contribute to biodiversity conservation, uh, things like increasing carbon sequestration and also the delivery of other vital ecosystem services like improving human health and well-being or um, something that we I feel very strongly about is enhancing positive human connections with nature. So this continuum that you're seeing on the screen here includes a range of activities and interventions that can help improve environmental conditions and then also reverse ecosystem degradation. 
So the continuum highlights interconnections among these different activities and then also recognizes that there are specific characteristics of the locality you're working in that dictate the activities best suited to occur. So you might have some or uh, all of these activities that happen or these conditions that happen at these sites. So as you move from left to right and you're working through this continuum, ecological health, biodiversity outcomes, and the quality and quantity of ecosystem services all increase together. So this project in particular is not just narrowly focusing in on invasive species management, but an overall improvement of these ecosystems under consideration. So if you're looking to the bottom of the continuum on the screen here, you'll notice there's four major categories listed of restorative practices. So this includes reducing impacts, remediation, rehabilitation, and ecological restoration. The first three that I mentioned, so that reducing impact, remediation, and rehabilitation are ways, are restorative ways to the extent that they help to reduce the causes or ongoing effects of degradation. They help to enhance the potential for ecosystem recovery and then also promote that transition to sustainability. All of those are important factors into and part of ecological restoration. So from a large scale perspective, Ecological restoration, when implemented effectively and sustainably, contributes to protecting biodiversity, improving human health and well-being, increasing food and water security, and then also supporting climate change mitigation, resilience, and adaptation. This is a solutions-based and collaborative approach to repair ecological damage and rebuild a healthier system by enhancing natural recovery carried out by plants and animals. Areas that we'll be working in, such as the Eastern Lake Ontario Riparian Corridors, are dynamic communities of plants, animals, and microorganisms that interact together within their physical environment. So the removal or suppression of invasive plants or animals in this area creates an opportunity to restore these systems to its natural ecological character and function, and then also to maintain resilience and guard against future, reinf or future or reinfestations of invasive species. So when combined with conservation and sustainable use of these lands, ecological restoration is that link that we need to move our local, regional, and global, even global, environmental conditions from a state of degradation to one of net positive improvement. So focusing back to that continuum, thinking more about that middle ground there, or the rehabilitation activities or repairing those systems, um, following invasive species management, there's many critical activities that must or should occur. So our goal in these projects is to recreate or initiate or accelerate the recovery of the ecosystem that's been disturbed, followed by continued monitoring and maintenance as well. It's not just a, a one step, everything is done. There's so many conditions that you have to consider for projects like this, including so soil, water, sunlight, existing species, erosion or destabilization too are very important to this project, and then the risk or impact of new invasion. Although many ecosystem processes do operate at larger spatial scales, projects like this in the Great Lakes Basin Watershed or the Lake Ontario Minor Tributaries Watershed are small scale projects that can have profound impacts on their local and regional communities, regardless of their spatial scale. So it's important to think about scaling up our work because Areas like the projects that I'm going to be talking about in a moment here have very important connectivity to the larger picture and can have a large impact on regional migratory fish, insects, and bird species. Now I'm going to transition to you discussing the first uh, aquatic restoration initiative project that's occurred, and then I'll talk about a second project in a few moments. So these are both designed to identify uh, the most deserving areas in need of attention. So the first project I'm talking about is occurring, well, it initially started at three tributaries in Eastern Lake Ontario based on phase one. There was an initial baseline assessment. Phase two was to respond to that assessment and then reduce impact through management and then also initiate this remediation phase. Phase three, which is happening this year, is the hab habitat rehabilitation and monitoring. So our goal is a native species recovery and to improve the ecosystem function of this region. So phase one, a little bit more in depth and in information about this part. So the study area, as I mentioned, was Sandy Creek, South Sandy Creek, and Deer Creek. We started with a literature review of the region, and then we went out and completed an assessment with a subcontractor of the aquatic and riparian areas, including visual observation, rake tosses, horizontal plankton net toads, and setting aquatic live traps. 
The complete the results of this project were a complete analysis of those sites and then restoration recommendations for what to look forward to. One of the most exciting things about this first phase was we were finally getting boots on the ground or in the water or boats in the water, however you want to say that. But we were able to not only survey for invasive species, but also native species as well. So the fish you can see here um, on the bottom left hand side, you can see a picture of a live trap that was used at one of the sites. And the fish you can see at the top of the screen is actually a pirate perch, which is a fish species that resides in low gradient streams with large woody debris. The cool thing about this fish is that it hadn't been seen in this select tributary since before 1977. So almost 50 years that this fish had been undetected in this area. So although we weren't necessarily looking for this species, we were able to find that and collect a voucher specimen to submit and keep on record. So super awesome, very exciting part of this work. That final report of phase one is actually online on our website. So if you're interested, you can check that out. That includes those in-depth recommendations for restoration and the study areas, all the results of the study itself, and uh, a lot of other information. The results of this determined that the largest threat to these, the health of these ecosystems was actually the riparian areas along South Sandy Creek, which included Japanese knotweed and phragmites in somewhat abundant distribution in a select area. So that led us to phase two, but before I talk about that, one of the other exciting parts of this project is we were able to get a drone out and do an assessment of uh, these tributaries. So we had uh, Zach Sinek from our Adirondack office come out and complete some drone flights. And this is an image of the South Sandy Creek site. So this is where majority of the restoration work is focused uh, moving forward after phase one. And so the cool thing about these don't drone drive maps is that they contain a much higher level of detail or spatial resolution compared to what you could find in Google Earth. So if you look on the screen towards the right hand side, you see a small red box. So I'm going to kind of blow this up a little bit and give you an example of why this drone work was so important to this project. In a typical Google Earth image that we get, you can see the image on the screen here. It's a little blurry. You can get out some of the trees and you can kind of tell. Uh, what you're looking at here. But the photo represents each pixel on this photo is a two foot by two foot space or land area. And so if you take a drone and you use that, it's a two inch by two inch land area. So this is the exact same location, but just look at the comparison, the difference between being able to assess these two systems just through this ortho map. So it's super exciting for us to be able to use this technology or this, uh, these other tools in our toolbox to conduct more further analysis. So these bites occurred before the treatment and they're going to occur um, after treatment as well. And we'll be able to compare some of the differences and assess visual changes in the vegetation and the health or structure of the riparian area. Phase two, which occurred in 2021, was that riparian area management or rem remediation. So we worked with Cardinal, who was a contractor subcontractor that has extensive experience developing and implementing very large scale complex restoration projects. One example of that was their role in the Onondaga Lake Superfund habitat restoration work. Um, they assisted with the design and restoration of a 35 acre wetland habitat there along over a mile of shoreline on Onondaga Lake. So we were very excited to be able to work with Cardinal and the goal of this phase was really to get out on the ground again, suppress the current known populations of invasive species, conduct the biomass removal, and then initiate the native species uh, reintroductions to move towards that final restoration goal. Um, and one of the other things that we realized was given the high use of this site for recreation at South Sandy Creek, we realized that it would be really important to install an interpretive panel at this site talking about this work, riparian areas, and invasive species and restoration, and why it's also important. Uh, the site specifically is used by hundreds of people a weekend who are going out there to bird watch, to hike along the trail, to put canoes or kayaks, or stand up paddle bars into the actual creek and go out to the beach. So that's all, you know, the high use in that interpretive panel was a, a different component that we hadn't originally thought of that was a really good piece to strengthen this work. 
So before the treatment in 2021, we went out and did another assessment to get some better footage and some more information about the banks and the, um, the areas that were going to be treated. Um, so if you're looking at the picture here on your screen, you can see Japanese knotweed along the banks, but then also floating in the water. So that was a full stem of Japanese knotweed intact with roots on it, and it was just floating down this creek. And so that, for, to us, further evidence how important this project actually was in not only improving the habitat in these regions, especially with the known connectivity to the toxicity of Japanese knotweed, but also to the um, fact that we'd be reducing potential spread of this species to other ecologically important areas. So that was a very exciting component for us. So at the end of last year, 2021, we were able to successfully treat 3.2 acres of Phragmites and Japanese knotweed. And we were able to get really good extensive maps of those areas and then also get a better look and understanding of the native species at this site. We developed an interpretive panel, which you can see in the bottom left-hand side here, which is to be posted at the site in the spring. So we're excited to put that up. And if you look at the, um, the image of South Sandy Creek here, majority of the work was occurring in the lower right hand portion and the interpretive panel will be near the parking lot that you can see in like the very bottom right hand side of the screen. Um, last year we did use uh, stem injections and foliar applications for both the uh, for Japanese knotweed and then just foliar applications for the Phragmites and that was some of the glyphosate solution. Um, so we uh, actually did two rounds of treatments last year and so We'll be going back to see the success of that, although it's estimated to be at least over 80% based on what we saw last year. Um, there is a new requirement with the state that glyphosate is not approved for state lands anymore. So we are in the process of determining phase three work, but I'll get to that in a few minutes before I jump ahead of myself. Uh, so our native seed mix that we use, we distributed at all of the treatment sites just to kind of get a step up on the process. So if we were able to um, get any of these native seeds seeds to germinate and start growing, uh, that would be fantastic. So we did have some requirements. They needed to be listed as native within the New York Flora Association. And um, it, they had, I think most or all of the species had a vouchered presence within this legal prism, if not that county specifically. So we didn't want to use any annual species. We wanted to really focus in on native species that were found at this site and just kind of further reducing any potential impact beyond that. So phase three is happening in 2022. Very excited for this part. We're going to be returning to the sites. And what you can see on the screen here is a map of all of the sites that were treated. So this is all of the uh, Japanese knotweed or Phragmites stands. And so we're going to monitor for all the regrowth, retreat all of that as needed, and then continue improving our native species restoration part. And so um, planting species further uh, spreading seed and all of that. And then one of the exciting things is that we'll continue those drone flights that I talked about and then we're developing a long-term monitoring plan. So hopefully looking for a 2023 to 2027 plan. Um, and then on June 11th, we are going to be doing an experience event at the site, which I'll talk more in a moment. So one of the cool things about tools and technology and the work that we're doing in our region is that we have an abundance of uh, different technologies that we have access to. So I talked about those drone flights and those maps, but we also have this ROV, which you can see pictured in the right two images that can be driven underwater and it records and takes pictures under the water. So we might be able to get an opportunity to get eyes on fish species, like you can see the salmon swimming across the screen in this video. Um, this is at the, uh, I think this is at Oswego River or in the Oswego Harbor this video specifically. But so you can see fish species, we can also get close-ups of uh, plant species underwater. So that's super exciting for us to be able to not have to do a whole bunch of break tosses to understand the macrophyte distributions. We can actually just drive the ROV and get some understanding that way. So we're excited to continue using that in 2022. And I know I'm probably moving a little bit fast on some of this, but moving to that June 11th event, we're excited because we're going to hopefully be able to do some uh, hands-on plant identification of both aquatic and terrestrial species. 
posting a guided walk along those restoration sites as well as a paddle along the creek out to the beach area. And then uh, teaching people about IMAP invasives and iNaturalist mobile apps, different ways that we can track invasive and native species, as well as having demonstrations on watercraft inspection, environmental DNA sampling, and using that underwater ROV. So all super exciting components. Um, this also happens to fall in the New York Invasive Species Awareness Week and the Society of Ecological Restorations Make a Difference Week as well. So um, I'm going to transition to uh, Fluos Prism special projects that have been occurring in the Eastern Lake Ontario Dune region and the, the work that we've been doing here. So again, this is a three-phase project. So phase one was conducting that initial baseline assessment. Phase two, reducing those impacts of invasives through management, initiating that remediation. And then phase three, um, potential uh, continued habitat rehabilitation and monitoring depending on budget allocations and if funding is about available. So in 2021, a dune assessment was, or an invasive species assessment was conducted on the Eastern Lake Ontario Dune region by the Eastern Lake Ontario Dunes Foundation. And this report includes multiple areas within the 17 mile stretch of the barrier dunes, um, which are critical habitat for many rare, endangered and threatened species, as well as acting as important migratory migratory corridors for birds, fish, and insects alike. So within this, it included, again, those recommendations for restoration or future work to occur at the site and profiles for certain areas and the invasive species that were found there, as well as recommendations for treatment or management options for that. So that was really exciting. And based on the results of that, we were able to um, Kind of look forward to a new project so we're transitioning to that phase now and so our our goal for this new project is to remain focused on those riparian area species that are impacting our aquatic environment and that included phragmites and so uh, we actually had five sites that had phragmites stands and um, we took multiple things into consideration including location accessibility risk of spread and estimated cost of the project and so what we actually determined was that we were looking really just focusing in on this North Sandy Pond project. And so this is approximately one to two acres of Phragmites, which unfortunately is expanding each year and we're able to measure that expansion over a year. So it is spreading pretty quickly and we're hoping to put a stop to that. So this is on the barrier beach that is north of the channel that leads into Sandy Pond, if you're familiar with the region. Um, this includes both private and public land. So we're working with private landowners to do some work on their property. And so what you see in the picture on the left here is this is actually an access site for construction vehicles to the beach where they're doing some dune restoration and dredging. Um, so we kind of thought about all of that and then looking at the estimated cost of this project. And we thought more about how if we did a project at this North Sandy Pond location, it would actually protect so many other investments, including a couple of huge grants including the North Pond Resiliency Project and many more. So depending on budget, we might be able to not only do the work in this area, but also add some of those other Fragmite stands as well. Uh, one of the exciting things about this is that we were able to acquire additional funding for, well, you can see in the, the pictures here actually, before I talk about that, is that you can see here some of the um, Fragmite spreading is pretty sparse in some areas. And so we're hoping to be able to get ahead of that. Uh, but one of the exciting things about this project is once we had selected this site, we were able to acquire additional monetary support from another grant for purchasing native shrub species, as well as support for beechgrass and dune willow uh, plantings as well. So that's all exciting. And it just kind of builds on the success or potential success of this project. So kind of uh, rephasing again, so 2022 for this, we're going to continue mapping and assessing that population of Phragmites in the North Sandy Pond area that I talked about. And we'll initiate that management and restoration to happen simultaneously, and then develop a long-term monitoring plan. And as part of this, uh, the reason why I say the management and restoration have to happen simultaneously is that this is a very sensitive habitat. And so we do know that there is um, uh, an increased risk for destabilization and erosion at this site uh, if we do any management without kind of thinking ahead of the game. So we're working on a plan right now for this project. It's very early on, but I just wanted to share all of that with you today. 
And also to emphasize that volunteers are always needed for projects like this. If anyone's interested in helping us improve the resiliency of the Eastern Lake Ontario region or these dunes regions, please let us know. Sign up on our website that you can see the link at the bottom of the screen here. And uh, you can join us out in the field sometime. So I just kind of want to bring it all back together and kind of circle back with everything and just talk about what I was introducing at the beginning and how all the work that we're all doing is completely connected. So invasive species are among the main causes of biodiversity loss and species extinctions. And we know now that the proliferation of invasive species is often exasperated by climate change. So through many scenarios, the ranges of species are contracting or expanding or shifting with climate change. And in some cases, new invasive species or pests are able to actually move into different areas. And so this is causing a decline or could cause a decline of native species in these ecosystems. And then further kind of following this feedback loop of accelerating climate change and getting more invasive species uh, in some of our regions. So with projects like these and through collaboration with all of you on the line today, um, together we can try to reverse this loop so we can combat invasive species by protecting bio bio biodiversity and help to mitigate those changes in climate as well. And we all know that sometimes climate change is a little bit overwhelming and it, it, pre it presents this immense challenge to management. And then also, you know, thinking about it from the other component, it does provide us with unparalleled opportunities to manage for change. So we can together think creatively or optimistically on ways that we can treat the climate crisis as an opportunity for change in the work that we're doing. So really focusing in on restoring these ecosystems in biodiversity friendly ways or thinking about climate change resilient species when we're doing our projects to help further increase the effectiveness of them. And if any of you are working out in, in the aquatic world, or the riparian world or wetlands, you know that these environments prove to have a lot more challenges than some others. Um, but thinking about these ecosystems and how they really are critical components of the global environment or thinking in the bigger picture of the Great Lakes Basin as well. Um, so whether we're talking about going out and collecting samples of water for detecting low abundance invasive species or native species populations through eDNA work, or we're conducting rake tosses to get better understandings of macrophyte distribution, or we're doing these projects where we're managing Japanese knotweed or Phragmites species, um, just thinking about restoring these native habitats, the impact that we have is so much further than that small spatial scale of three to five to six to 10 acres of land. And that impact can be felt across larger watersheds or even you know, thinking the bigger picture of the Great Lakes Basin. So as we move into the finality of this webinar, I just wanted to thank everybody again for joining and listening to this presentation this afternoon. I hope that as we move into the question and discussion time, you're all thinking about ways that we might be able to collaborate or work together to sustain healthy waters so that our ecosystems can continue to provide amenities and services that society has come to expect, but also working together to help native aquatic and riparian species flourish. So thank you again, and I'll take questions. Thank you, Brittany. And Sliwa Prism would also like to give a special acknowledgement to the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and the Environmental Protection Fund um, for supporting the PRISM network and Sliwa Prism. Uh, if there's any questions, feel free to take yourselves off mute or continue to use the chat box. Um, and we could address those questions now. Or even if you just have comments or anything that you'd like to share about the work that was presented today. Got some crickets. Well, if anybody has questions about any of the work that we're doing, or you just want to reach out to talk more about projects that you're working on, and heck, if you even want to talk about things that you tried to do that weren't successful that you might find beneficial for us to know about, please reach out to me via email. 
um, we, you know, we can get in touch. We can talk over a separate private meeting to just talk about the work and ways that we can improve together. Thanks, Megan, for popping my email into the chat box there. Okay, we've got Patricia Schulenberg reaching out. Patricia, you can come off mute if you want. Uh, but the question uh, is, oh, go ahead, Brittany. I was going to say, I can answer the question about sources for funding for the shrub beachgrass planting. Uh, so we have a couple different sources. So there's one grant that we um, are able to get monetary support from. And so the shrub species will likely either be purchased from the state nursery or the cardinal nursery as well. Um, and then also, uh, you know, if we need to think about other avenues, we can do that. And that funding is coming from um, the WQIP grant as well as the uh, EPF funds for the contract with the Sleepo Prism. I hope that answers all parts of that question. <laughs> Fantastic. I don't really see any other questions coming through. Um, I really appreciate the time that you guys all spent with us this afternoon, and uh, I'm glad to be able to give you 20 minutes of your day back. I'm sure there's lots of things that you can all be doing separately from this. So thank you again so much for joining. And Megan, if you have anything else you'd like to share before people sign off. Well, thank you for, for joining us, and I'll be sending out a follow-up email uh, within the next couple of days with a link to this recording and other resources. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.